at that when we hit chapter 6, which are all the commands. You will see that in the labs. Now, why wouldn't it have been no... Uh, it can be. It can be? It can be. That's why we'll hit it when... Mm -hmm. Again, who has not been able to get it? Hey, John, are you out there? I'm assuming you are. I know he's been. So, where was I going? Who hasn't been able to log on to their BOSUN machine and do BOSUN work yet? I haven't tried to. Well, I did here. You did here? Yes. Okay, and we talked about some of the commands. Like, with enable, you can type enable. But if you hit EN and enter, it will work. Because it knows there's no other command that uses an EN something. And it will accept it. It's a shortcut. There are a lot of little shortcuts that we can use in Cisco on the command line. And the unbug or the no debug, it's just another shortcut. Why? Because you want to turn it off as fast as possible. Because it will kill your router if you're in a production environment and turn on debugging. And you'll see why. And we'll tell you, don't ever do it unless it's a last resort. We don't ever do what? Don't worry about it. We're just making a comment. It's going to be in Chapter 6. <laughs> We're not going to do Chapter 6 right now. We're going to start with Chapter 1. Because we have to start someplace. Okay. I like that. So, last week on the board... I put a bunch of terms up there. I put PC, hub, switch, router, server, cables. And if we look on page three, and again, I flip back and forth through here. We're going to be looking at some questions in here. First thing they show us is a three-component network. There's two PCs and a hub. Look at the little picture of that hub. See the double arrow? We're on page three. Mm -hmm. That indicates a hub. You've got to be familiar with these little pictures because in the real test or in other questions or whatever, they're going to show you a device. And there is a difference between him and him. There's a big difference. So pay attention to the pictures. Pay attention to what they're providing you. Also, like I say, I write little 3 by 5 cards. I don't make them flashcards. I put the, whatever information, the question, or whatever I see on the top, I put the only correct answer on the bottom. What port is Telnet? Kurt, what ports tell that? Thank you. Here's my flashcard. I don't make it a question with four answers. The reason being, you don't want to reinforce information that is not right. Also, you don't know what type of answers they could give you. You put the correct, whatever you're looking for, Correct information, and you can flip through. If you make it a flashcard, think about this. Every question you're going to hit, except the Sims, is going to give you four, five, or six potential answers. Am I correct? Yeah. Of these, you start reading questions or answers to these questions, and you have any familiarity with this, you should be able to at least eliminate two. Okay? Now you have a 50-50 shot, hopefully. But if they don't get, if you practice with nothing, you have nothing to trigger. Now you're looking, what port is this? Shit. You have to stop and flip. It's going to slow you down. You're going to try to guess first. And if you keep guessing wrong for the first four or five times you do it, you're reinforcing the wrong answer. You don't want to get into that habit. Anything that's in bold, anything that is in italics, anything that says default, know it, live it, learn it, because you're going to get tested on it. Whether it's a practice test, whether it's questions I give you, or whether it is the real test, they can ask down to 
what default size is this? Okay, so let's go back and look at our basic subnet. Basically, we have two PCs and a hub. And what we have to do is we have two different things that we're going to deal with in a network. And they're called domains. These are not Microsoft domains. They have nothing to do with users. They have to do with traffic. Traffic has to go from point A or PCA to PCB. There are many different ways we can do this. We could go or a different color. Don't want that color. <laughs> a crossover cable between two PCs. That will let those two PCs communicate, but they can't communicate with anybody else. It's their own little network. We can go through a hub here. That allows us to send traffic back and forth between anybody that is a member of this hub. The hub can have 4, 8, 16, 32. Yes? It has, has to be the same network. Oh, not on the hub. We don't even have a network yet. No. We don't have an IP address. We're, no, we're close to that at this point. Yeah, okay. We could also change the hub for a switch. We could go right to a router. How do they communicate? Again, we have a brand new network. I just took two PCs that have never been turned on before and are set up for DHCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, which means give me an IP address and a hub. We're going to learn to get rid of hubs in a little while, but we have a hub. How do they start communicating? PCA sends a request automatically when he boots up saying, find me an IP address. He doesn't have an IP address, so you know he's not talking TCP. <coughs> the network is smart enough to know, I'm going to use an address already assigned to this PC that's never going to change. And that's its MAC address. It's also called a hardware address. It's also called a physical address. See how we get to know that term in multiple meanings? Yeah, because of the physical layer and the OSI we'll, model. We'll get there also, yes. But when we're in there, MAC addresses are all, they're burnt to the network card. Or they're burnt onto <laughs> the motherboard that's being, or that holds the network card. And you'll find that more and more today. You know, network cards and sound and video cards are all built onto the motherboard instead of individual components. So basically, if A wants to talk to B, he's going to send out a request. Who's out there? I'm looking for B. B's going to get that information. He's going to say, A is coming from, um, and again, I'm going to cut down our, our mask here so that I don't have to... Our, our MAC address, so I don't have to write it a lot. We're just going to call him A, 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 and he's B, 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 B. So A can talk to B. Okay? They can communicate using some low-level protocols. They start communicating all the time. The hub just connects the systems together. That's all he's for. We know that MAC addresses are not changeable unless we actually change the physical device. We take that network card out and put a new network card in. Okay? There might be some devices that you can do dynamically. Go into the server. You might be able to do certain things. We don't care. We're assuming right now it's burnt. It can't be changed. It's always the same. We got to think that direction on the test. Here's one of the other problems that you'll see. <laughs> Don't think real world. Think book. There's going to be times they, you know, they'll say you're going to do this, this, and this, and you say, I'd never do that in real life. That doesn't make any dip. You know, it makes no sense. The book is right. The test is going to be using the, the information from the book, not the real world. So. Is the right way, the wrong way, and in this case, the Cisco way. 
So let's get back. We know that we're going to use an, a MAC address. A MAC address is part of every communication that goes between two devices. That even includes our switches, our hubs, our routers. He's going to build a MAC address table. This guy is going to build a MAC address table. And he's going to build a MAC address table. They're going to keep it because once I know somebody, I can cut out a lot of traffic. Because instead of going from one place to everybody, I can go one to one. However, hubs suck. <laughs> they are dumb devices. They do not really store and understand what a MAC address and how to deal with them. So instead of sending him just a PCB, if he has eight ports, every packet that he gets, he sends to everybody. Okay? He really doesn't understand the total purpose of this. But he does have a buffer. He has a little buffer. But we can't deal with it. And in the Cisco or the CCNA world, number one, if you have a hub, throw it out and put a switch in. And the reason being, if I'm sending a package between a ping from A to B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, and K don't need to know about it. But they will if there's a hub here. And if there's a hub here, everybody's getting everybody else's traffic. They're just going to drop it. They're going to look at the MAC address in the packet. They're just going to drop it. So we're sending a lot of information down our network that we do not need. We know about broadcast. We've talked about broadcasts. There's broadcast of FF, 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 FF at the MAC address label. That's in hex. Remember we mentioned that last week. We also have a broadcast address for every network. 192.168.1.255. That means I am sending track information to everybody. There are certain things that I have to I don't know yet. And the only way I'm going to find out is saying, who's out there? Again, we're we still haven't even gotten an IP address. We're using Mac. Okay? Now, at some point, 99% of us are going to end up using something called TCPIP. Has anybody not heard about TCPIP yet? Okay, that's a good start. At least I didn't have any hands go up this time. TCPIP is an address scheme. I think we've seen it once or twice in the last week. Okay? But it's very important. It is an address assigned to a device so that we can always talk to that device. And think about it as your telephone number, or think about it as your post, your mailbox, or your house address. You don't have two addresses on the same street with the same number. If they happen to be something that there is with two different, one might have an A, one might have a B. So 201A, 201B, South Sycamore Street, wherever, dot Kentucky. Okay? But they're it always individual. Otherwise, I get your mail, you get my mail, and I don't want to get in my mail. Does that make sense? So we're going to start looking at these IP addresses and how they're going to be used for communication. Once we get that IP address, there's something called ARP. Has anybody heard of ARP? Address Resolution Protocol. What does ARP do? It sends requests. No, it It resolves. It's address resolves. It resolves. Resolution protocol. IP address. The IP address to the MAC address. To the MAC address. Actually, yeah, the MAC address to the IP address. The MAC. See, I always get that. Damn. Yeah. That and then AR 
uh, reverse arc. arc. Reverse arc. We'll hit reverse arc later. Okay. But arc is used to deal with MAC addresses. It keeps track of them and it knows. So does it resolve MAC addresses to IP addresses? It can, yes, because it will hold it in an arc table. But right now we don't have a MAC address yet. Now I'm going to change this just a little. I'm going to change this to a switch instead of a hub. Why? A switch is a smart device. He has intelligence built into him. When he builds his MAC address table, he's going to say, number one has A, 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 when he sends a request. The switch is going to say, hey, there's somebody called A, 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 A in port one. The first time he gets something, he's going to flood or send out through every single port with the exception of the one that the traffic came in on. You already know who's on one. This guy's looking for, for B. B down here is on 6. B's going to respond to that request. The switch is going to say, 6 has B, 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 B. Now, whenever 1 has to talk to, or A talks to B, the switch knows, hey, you're going here, and you're going here and I don't have to send all that other traffic to every other port. Big difference. Okay? Both the switch and the router understand that. Don't even go to routers yet. Okay. Because we'll, we'll see why, but routers don't pass MAC addresses. It's physically impossible. That's why we have to use TCP IP. So, our little network is now getting a little more complex. We just added a third PC down here. The first time he makes a call for anything, the switch will remember who he is. If A now needs to talk to, to uh, C, the switch doesn't have to flood everybody. He already knows who C is. He's keeping it in his MAC address table it saves a lot of traffic. Just by plugging in, he knows? Or he as soon as the PC makes its first request, oh, okay. and guess what? Yeah. It's going to announce himself on the network, okay. and he's probably going to request an IP address. Okay, okay if, all right. If A is trying to contact C, and C is new. But C is going to make some type of request as soon as he boots up, okay. most probably saying, can I get an IP address because I don't have one? Okay, He's okay. going to make a request, a broadcast, saying, I'm looking for that DHCP server to give me so the address. So his port location is going to, that switch is going to... Remember that you know, port location. I got it. So CCCC is on port 9, and it's going to remember that, right? Yep. It's going to hold it in a table. Now, just like a PC, this is just a little piece of memory. It has so much room. If you turn off the device, it wipes it out. It's in RAM. And they change all the time. Yes. This is a laptop. He gets turned off, goes someplace else. At some point, this guy's going to disappear. Why? He's not there. A new laptop logs in. He'll update the MAC address table. Now, we get down into these things that are called collision domains and broadcast domains. Where am I? We're looking at this figure 1.2 and it's a segment separated by collision domains. Okay? Collision domains are made up as part of a broadcast domain. We have already talked about broadcast. Okay, what does a broadcast do? That broadcast address basically says this is the address that I can talk to anybody or request something from anybody. I'm a radio transmitter. I'm broadcasting. Whoever turns on my channel or whoever's on my hub or switch will hear me. Collisions. Does anybody know what collisions mean? That's when more than one, like, 
smashes into the other, gets in the way of the other. Gets in the way. Let's take it as traffic on the highway. You have a wire. So many cars can go that way at the same time. So many cars can come this way at the same time. And they have to be timed just right so that we don't have a five-car pileup on the highway. Collisions. By default, hubs or switches are used for or are part of a collision domain, and routers break up our broadcast domains. We can't broadcast beyond a router. Why not? Why do you think we wouldn't want to broadcast beyond a router? It's going out to the internet. At what point do you stop? At what point do we stop sending broadcasts to everybody in the world? Routers don't pass them on purpose. So let me go back because I think I'm, we've got to cover one other thing. Network segments are used to break up large networks. We've seen some things recently. We have, oh, 32, 64, 2046 hosts on a network. That's a big network. First off, do you think we have a switch that can hold 2,000? No. We can piggyback a bunch of switches, but we want to break these up into littler broadcast and littler collision domains so that the traffic flows better. And we do that with switches. So is each port on a switch a different collision domain? Each port on a switch can break up a collision domain. Look at this little network on Chapter 5. We have a, a switch, we have a hub, and we have a couple of PCs. I'm sorry. I, did I say I said? Thank you. I told you, you know, sometimes I have issues. Network congestion is always a problem. The less network congestion we have, the better everything flows, the faster we can download our videos and our music and have our phone cons through Skype. The more traffic, the slower everything gets. Our movies get choppy. They start buffering. Our sound keeps pausing and cutting out. We don't want that in today's environment. Causes of network traffic. Too many hosts in a broadcast or a collision domain. These are coming right off that page five. Broadcast storms. Too many multicast or too much multicast traffic. We haven't talked multicast yet. We'll hit him in a little while. And low bandwidth. We're using Ethernet instead of fast Ethernet or gigabit. There's a big difference between 10 MIP and 100 MIP or 1,000 MIP. And adding hubs for connectivity. Again, we know hubs are dumb devices. They send out traffic to every port no matter what, whether you need it or not. That's going to increase the traffic on our network. So if we look at this figure in this segment, we're going to break it down into smaller collision domains. So if we look at this and we have the hub, the switch connects to three different devices. Each one of those makes up a collision domain from the switch. Okay? Hubs don't break up collision domains. Why? They just flood everything. They make collision domains. They make it worse for us. So just looking at this little switch in our three devices, we have three collision domains, and we have one broadcast domain because routers break up broadcasts. They can give you a question like that on the test and show you a network and say how many collisions, how many broadcasts. Uh, on this, you're talking about figure one, two? Yep. Okay. Um, it's our... Um... Each port on the hub, on the switch, 
makes its own collision, collision domain. domain. Um, and the broadcast domain is the hub. Pro we haven't even got into the router, so this is part of a single broadcast right now. Okay. Now, one other thing we want to know about switches is, if you have a, a 10100 switch, every port on that switch gets 100. It's not divided by the number of ports. So you have a gigabit switch, you're getting a gigabit through every connection you have on that network. If you have an Ethernet, you get in 10 through every single port. Okay? Hubs don't do that. They actually send traffic back and forth at the same time, and they all just get broken down. So hubs throw away. Don't even keep them. Mm -hmm. So we know broadcasts are, bro are broken up at a router, not a switch. So if we look on the next page, now we have a router. You said router. You mean hub? Router. Routers break up broadcast domains. So if we look at figure 1.3, we're now looking at a, a router that has three connections. We're looking at two switches, four PCs. One thing we want to understand right off the top, and we, I think I mentioned that, look at that router. He has three connections. Does anybody remember what I said about these connections last week? The nope. serial connection. Very good. Serial connections are little lightning bolts. Okay? They really don't play into this scenario. We're worrying about Ethernet, not serial right now. So, if I look at this picture, knowing that the lightning bolt doesn't count, how many collision domains do I have? Every port on a hub or on the switch is a six, six is a collision domain. I'm going from the router to switch lower, router to switch upper. There's two. Here's our network. So we're talking right now broadcast, I'm sorry, collisions. This switch and this switch, he has one, two, three, four, five, six connections. Am I incorrect here? Does everybody see how I'm getting six connections? One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes, sir. If you're using a switch instead of a hub, why would you have any co collisions? You'd have all collisions. It, with hubs? Yep. Yeah, but with a switch, you're still going to have collisions? Think about this. He knows how to talk to him. Yep. What happens if he wants to talk to him? <laughs> that guy and that guy are going to get shared, aren't they? So we can still have collisions between this. Even if they want to get out onto our serial, those two guys have to share that one cable. There's always the possibility for collisions. Especially if it's half duplex. That's even, we haven't even got into duplex yet. But yes, we will get there. So we have six collision domains. Now, I told you, Routers break up broadcast domains. One, two. We don't count the serial. Serial plays totally different than Ethernet. So, however many connections we have going into our router will be used to break up our broadcast domains. 
And again, remember what I told you earlier. This is from the perspective of our router. Inside the router, I have a interface there, 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 and there. To go outside of this router, you actually are going to a different network. I can't have two ports on the router pointing to the same network. It's confusing. So, there are different networks that have a different IP address scheme. That means they have a different network, they have a different broadcast address, and they have a separate or different set of hosts that are available to it. See how come we've been doing it the way we started with? So you understand how this works. Okay? So, two broadcasts, because that was the one coming out of the router. Everything that's coming out of the switches are their own. Is that also no broadcast going in? Because routers don't. Routers don't forward broadcast, so it, routers will never push. So you're talking about that. So but a router, but the, the but a router can send a broadcast. A router can send a broadcast. He might be looking for something. <laughs> okay, routers also break up collision domains. He does. He's connected to that switch. He breaks up collisions. We don't count them twice. But he does break up collision domains also. Yeah, collisions and broadcasts are layer two activity. They can be layer two or layer three. They can be layer two. I give you an IP address, 192.168.1.255, and I tell you it's last IP address. What is it? Last IP address immediately proceeding to the next network. It's a broadcast address. Yeah. So he better be able to do them. Right. That's why we've been studying broadcast for the last three weeks, three classes. You'll get it. You'll get it. I see the concern. <laughs> Don't have concern. You're scary. <laughs> what, that I can read your face? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When a PC, a, a switch, or a router receives, any traffic, it has to look at the frame layer and make a determination, is it for me, yes or no? If the destination isn't mine, most likely I am going to drop it. Or, depending on the device I am, a switcher or a router, I am going to pass it to somebody else and let them deal with it. We're going to see this over and over again. If PC or, or a server gets a frame that has a MAC address that isn't it. It just drops it. That's why we're trying to break these things up into smaller little pieces so that my router, or I'm sorry, my PC or my server doesn't have to spend half its processing time dropping packets that are not for it. <coughs> Why waste all the time on my PC? I can make my PC a lot faster if it doesn't have to go dump all this stuff. I can make my network a lot cleaner if I'm not sending the same thing out to 2,046 hosts in the network where only one of them actually needs it. Think of how much traffic. Think of your mailbox. How much junk mail do you get in your mailbox every day? How much cheaper do you think things would be and how better would the postal office be if they didn't have to deal with all this extra junk? Of course, that's where they make a lot of their money because they get it on bulk. But we don't really need all this junk and we don't care. We get it. We throw it away. How often do you really read or look at all that junk that you get? PC does the exact same thing. It's junk. Throw it away. It's not for me. Customer. Resident, to whom it may concern. It's not for me. I don't care about it. PCs do the same thing. Make sense now? Does that help a little? So, there are two advantages, advantages of using a router in our network. They don't forward broadcasts by default. Oh, wait a minute. 
You heard that. By default, know that. Good routers good. do not, it's right in the book, we're on page six. Routers do not forward broadcasts by default. So it can, but we got to change something to make it work. But that's very much one of these, which of these, A, B, or C, or choose all that apply, or whatever. Routers, they cannot, they cannot filter networks based on layer 3 information, or they can. Yes, thank you. Routers use layer 3 information to filter IP addresses. Okay? There are four router functions in our network. Packet switching, packet filtering, internetwork communications, and path selection. Now, you see how I can make this a question of choose two or choose that all apply? Those are the types of things you're going to have to study and think about when you're working for this exam. Routers are basically switches. They just work at a different level of the OSI model. And we'll talk about OSI in a little while. But we're also going to talk layers. And usually when we talk layers, we're talking the OSI model. And you'll understand when we get through this how it works. Um, switches will forward or filter frames. Filter means drop. If I'm filtering something, think about a coffee pot. I put everything in a filter. The water is going to go through, which is what I want. But it's not going to let the crap go through, is it? Filtering is not letting it through. It's dropping it. Forwarding means I'm going to send it to somebody else. It can only do one of two things. Forward or filter, which means dump or drop. Routers use logical addresses. Logical means they can change. It's an IP address. An IP address is a logical address. Yes, we can set something as a static address so it will never change. It doesn't mean it's not logical. Because at some point I could go and say, well, that machine died. I'm moving his IP address to another machine. Where the MAC address can't change. It's burnt into the device. Could I move the, I, the, the network card from computer A to computer B? Yes, I can. Then the computer with MAC address changed, but the MAC address never changed. It's burnt into the card. Routers can also um, provide packet filtering. Packet is the next layer up, and we're going to see these. When we get into the OSI model, we'll break these down. Packets deal with IP addresses. So static can will never change? Static means we've set it up so it shouldn't change. There are certain things that we want static addresses for. Anybody have a thought on what a static address would be used for? Back mode. I'm sorry? Back mode. Back mode? Yeah, it's not quite close enough. Try again. All right. Switches. Switches for management. Server server. Access point. Ser well, servers usually being things that we want other people to find very easily. The main name server is DHCP. Good. Things like our exchange server. The interfaces on our router. We don't want those to be changed. DNS, our web pages. When you go to www.johnmasoninstitute.com, it's going to resolve it to an IP address 173.13.10618. If that number changed, DNS is hard coded in the world. Unless I go out and say, fix or change DNS, he's always going to point at 18. If I had been using a uh, dynamic uh, address on my web server and he changed to 19, nobody's ever going to find my web page because it changed. Hosts, your regular computers, it doesn't matter because very rarely do we go out and try to connect to another router or another PC through something like a admin share. Okay. Also, we have 
DNS that will give us the name of the device that's automatically registered. But static means we hard coded it. It shouldn't, it won't change. Dynamic means it can change. So, let's see. Switches will forward a filter frames. Routers use logical addresses and provide what is called packet switching. Routers can also uh, packet filter using access lists. We're going to hear this again. Access lists, access control lists, ACLs. And when two networks connect using IP or IPv6, in this course we say IP, it's V4. 32-bit standard what we've been playing with for the last three days. If we're going to talk IPv6, they will say IPv6. And we'll learn about him a little later on. He's just a wee bit different. Routers use a routing table, a map of the internet work, to make path selection and forward packets to remote networks. In other words, it's like a map. My router is going to talk to whoever's beyond him. They already know each other, otherwise we can't send traffic. And through his buddy, he can learn about somebody else. And as part of this, they can make the determination, how do I get from point A to point B, so that we can go to www.co.jp, get something in Japan, in less than 30 hops. And it does it all automatically. We might have a little tweaking to do because we have control of a router. And we're going to see things about um, routing protocols that helps this talk from point A to point B. Chapter 8, Chapter 9, we'll deal with routing protocols. And will that also answer a question about um, hop counts? Uh, dropping like yes. you reach your limit or yes something. we will that's part of the protocols and each protocol has their own different set of criteria so switches do not have the capabilities to uh, filter as much or the uh, at least not an IP range they deal with layer two switches mainly are used to make our internet work function better Again, we're going to see things like internetwork, intranet versus internet. We all know the internet. We've heard inter internet, well, in, they call it internet, whatever, especially if you're from New England. The internet is everybody. The intra, our side, inside, our little private chunk of the world. Intranet work is our side. Intra network. So that's like a land. Yes, it's our land. Okay. They sometimes we've seen it called internet work. Right now, if it doesn't say internet, it's probably going to be us, because that's what we're <coughs> most concerned with, from our routers in. Switches are used to optimize our network traffic and switches are used to eliminate a lot of extra traffic because they don't flood everything. Next page on six, they're going to add something in here. See that little guy that says bridge? Page six, next page. Okay, I'm sorry, page eight, next page. <laughs> See that little guy that's a bridge? A bridge is a switch. We will never see a bridge probably in real life. Okay? However, in this case, if you see it, think of it as a switch. This bridge has three connectivities or three connections, three collision domains, just like a switch would be. We will hear the term bridge in other places, especially when we're trying to find the root bridge of a network. Okay, it's old terminology that has held over as the equipment has changed. 
bridges and switches are the same type of device. But there is a difference. Where is it? It says page 7. Bridges have a low number of ports. <coughs> bridges are software based and bridges are slower than switches. Okay? Switches, large number of ports. They're hardware based and they are faster than bridges. The reason being, if I can process something at the, at the router right on the, the part of the hardware, it is faster than going out and reading the software and then having the software do the um, calculations or the determination on what it's going to do. And again, bridges are basically obsolete. They're like hubs. You'll probably never see one. Switches are so cheap today, you know. Will we see it on the test? Maybe, maybe not. You might, but guess what? You already know what it is. It's software driven, few ports, and it's slower than a switch. It breaks up collision domains. That's all you need to know about it. So on page 8, figure 1.4, don't yell out answers. Let's count them. I want to know how many collisions, how many broadcasts we can get on 1.4. And when everybody has a number, just give me a little wave. Kirk has it written down in his book, so he doesn't count. And again, you can get this picture as a test question, and they can ask you this same question. What was the question? <laughs> how many collision and how many broadcast domains are in this network? Anybody got an answer yet? I see a smile or two. Another 30 seconds. Richard, what did you get for collision domains? Nine. Did anybody else get nine? Did anybody not get nine? I counted ten. There are nine. There did are you by any, any chance count the serial on the router? No. I... We will look at it in a second. How many broadcast domains did you get, David? Uh, three. Three. Anybody not get three? So let's look at them. I thought there were six broadcast domains, one from each of the switches. No, broadcast domains are broken up by the router. We have three connections, not counting the serial. So we have three broadcast domains. We only have three switches. We're going to, we have a bridge though. Oh, yes, that's right. So, if we look at the top one, the bridge makes three collision domains. If we go to the left, you have one, two, three, four, five. Because you have switches instead of hubs. And then if we go to the lower unit, we have one. Hubs do not break up collision domains. So, that's why we got to pay attention to the little pictures on our devices. Does everybody see how we get nine here? No. Where are you? Okay. I bridge access the switch also. I'm sorry? I thought it was bridge access the switch, so you become free for that. Also. Oh, okay, so let me draw this out. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Better than that. <laughs> 
So when a switch talks to a switch, it's one collision domain between, between them. two switches. So let's look at it. We, we just started with our broadcasts. The router has one, two, three. That's simple enough because we don't count the serial. Okay? Now, we have hubs and switches. Hub, hub. Yeah. Switch, switch, switch. Hub, hub, hub. So, let's start counting. Anything that's connected to a switch or a bridge. One, two, three. Everybody see that? They're connected to that bridge, so they count. This don't count. Hubs don't break them up. Let's go down to this one. I know I have one because the router also breaks up collision domains. Don't care, don't care, don't care, don't care because those are hubs. So I got one here and I got three here so far. Everybody with me? Is that counting? Are we still on the, uh, on the uh, what are we talking about? Collision domains, Patty. So I got one, two, three, four, Five on that side. I got that. This is one, that's two, that's three, that's four, that's five. Five, three, one gives me nine. At least in new math. Do we all see how we broke that down now? Hubs don't do this, and that's why we got to know what the little symbols say so we know the difference so we can break it down. I got to jump on a conference. So, this, I think I know what the problem is. And what's the problem, Pat? Okay. So, so the answer is nine? Nine and three. Nine and three? Nine collision domains yep. and three broadcast yep. domains. Oh, all right. I know what I did wrong. Okay. Then let's go look at the next the next page and do the next one. Again, raise your little hand when you let me know something if you've got one. Hey, Kirk. You don't have access to Boson right now. No, I know. I just... And the reason being is I've been upgrading and I've been using Windows 7 64 bit instead of the XP's, and they've been doing a lot better on the server. In other words, they're not sucking up all the CPU. And not releasing it. The 20, the 20, 135, right? Doesn't matter. It's turned off. When I turn it back on, probably I was hoping to do it this weekend, but I said no. Um, in the next day or so, it will still be 30, 135. I'll just give you a different machine to play with, and it seems a lot faster. It loads up a lot faster. Um, but I seen one or two little glitches, so. Just have to watch out for it if it comes up and doesn't give you a document. Oh, yeah. yeah, it makes it a little more difficult to actually do something with it, but we'll figure it out. So, everybody got an answer for me? David, what did you get for broadcast domains? Um, broadcast, <clears throat> excuse me, one. One. Stephen, what did you get for collision domains? I got nine. Got nine. 
Uh-oh. Uh -oh. What's the uh-oh about? What'd you get? I got 10. Okay. I got, yeah, I got 10. 10. 10 is correct. <laughs> we'll count them. You're right. You found the 10th one, huh? Yeah. Okay. We got 10 because we look. We have three switches, four switches. And under those, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. So, one, that was simple. Thank you. <laughs> Use black. Wow. Wow. What do you mean, wow? So there's one broadcast? One broadcast. Routers break up broadcasts. But how about the other three? One, switches? two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten collision domains. Ten collision domains. But I thought there were. I counted. <laughs> Routers. Break up broadcasts. Right. There's only one connection to that router. There's only one broadcast. That was simple. Now the book also does mention in here VLANs, and it, there is uh, one broadcast domain for each VLAN. But they really didn't tell us how many VLANs we had. And when we get into this, we'll see. VLANs actually have to go through routers to get from point A to point B. So if we're playing with VLANs, VLANs will also break up broadcast domain. That's For, not... Go ahead. Virtual LANs. Virtual LANs. And we'll talk about those when we get into switching in chapter all around 11, I think. So now we get into something that I've known for a long, long time. The OSI layer. OSI on page 10. Open System Interconnection Reference Model. Basically, it was designed to help make it easier for a piece of hardware or software change to be put into place without breaking everything else. Okay? It is basically a primary architecture for networks. It's an architecture model for networks. It describes data and the network infrastructure or network information and how they communicate with applications from one computer through a network media to another computer. They call it a layered approach and it's broken down into seven different small components. Page 12, they say the reference uh, advantages of the OSI reference model. It divides network communication processes into smaller and simpler components, thus aiding component development, design, and troubleshooting. We're probably worrying about the troubleshooting because I don't see us designing components or developing components. No, somebody else is going to do that. We're going to troubleshoot why something isn't working when we put their component in. Allows multi-vendor development through standardization of network components. In other words, if you have a device that's going to talk to TCP IP or IPv4, and she has a device that will do the exact same thing, they should be able to communicate with each other. It encourages industry standardization by defining what functions occur at what layer of the OSI model. Allows various uh, types of network hardware and software to communicate. And finally, it prevents changes of one layer having an effect or causing problems 
with another layer. So here's a, here's a way I can think about it. Anybody know the difference between a GM and a Chevy uh, Blazer? Besides the nameplate? Besides the nameplate, nothing. Except for how much you're going to pay for it. <clears throat> but that means if I have a Jimmy and he has a Blazer and we have to go replace our water pumps, the same water pump would fix either of those cars. It's the same car, it just has a different name. If I want to put a new network card into my computer, I don't care if I buy an Intel or a 3Com card. They are designed to do the same thing. What they do and how they do it, it doesn't matter. As long as they can talk to the layer above and the layer below, following the standards, it will work with our, with our computer. If it doesn't follow the standards, it probably isn't going to go very far. So, there are seven layers. You need to memorize these seven layers. If you don't, you will have problems. And we always start at layer one or the physical layer. The data link. Network. Transport. Session. Presentation. And then I'm going to just throw it here, application. Okay? Now there's a there's a little memoric for this. Please do not throw sausage pizza away. That's how I learned it in 1995. Please do not throw pizza away. If you can remember that, you should have no problems remembering the seven layers. Okay? There's other little tricks to that. I've heard three or four of them. Fortunately, this is the one I've learned, and it's the one I've remembered for, oh, since 1995. And guess what? I still use it sometimes. Because we'll see why later. But this makes it real easy for us. Now that we know them, I'm going to give you a little hint. We're not going to play with those two that much. We have to understand what they are, that they're part of it. But for our purposes in routers and switches, layers 5 and 6 really have no bearing on us. 7 does. Oh, yeah. We're going to have to play with 7. Okay. You'll see why. They say the following network devices operate at all seven layers of the OSI model include network management stations, web and application servers, gateways, but not default gateways. Gateway, there's a difference between a gateway and a default gateway. Default gateway, we'll hit a little later. And network hosts. Think about this. Any PC that you sit on, that you can enter information, you're using an application. Right? Layer 7. If you want to transmit some type of information from your PC that you can type, to another device, it has to use all seven layers. The upper layer, application, file print message, database and application servers, it provides a user 
interface. Remember, this is going to be a key. If you can enter information, and I'm going to use ping for an example. What application am I using to run ping? Command prompt. Very good. Oh, oh. Ping is not an application. Ping is a protocol. It is a utility that we are going to run. It is not where we enter the information. Trace route is the same thing. We're running it at a command prompt in a Windows computer. So ping is not the application that we're entering information at. Presentation. It does data in, uh, encryption, compression, and translation services. It presents data in handling processes such as encryption. Okay. Session is for dialogue control. It keeps different applications data separate. And we'll see how that works in a little while. The lower layers. These are the ones that we really, really have to be involved in. The uh, transport. End-to-end -end communication, which includes uh, TCP and UDP. Network is routing. It provides logical addressing, which routers use for the path destination. Data link does framing, and framing combines packets into bytes and bytes into frames. Provides access to media via a MAC address and performs uh, error detection but not correction. And then we have the physical, our actual physical topology. It moves bits from computer A to computer B or from A to a switch or whatever. It specifies voltage, it specifies wire speed and pinouts of cable. And when we say voltage, high or low? Anybody remember what high or low gives me? Zeros and ones. Zeros and ones. It's our binary layer. So again, on page 14, application layer, they say it is end user interface. We're on the computer. We open our Internet Explorer to go type www.google.com. The browser is our application, and it's going to use everything else because it has to go out on the Internet to find Google. Okay? Presentation layer presents data to the application and is responsible for data translation and code formatting. Has anybody ever tried to open up a Word document, a .doc, in Notepad? What do you get? Bunch of symbols. That's because Notepad doesn't understand the character set in the data that is in Word. Presentation takes care of that. When you open Word, and it's going to deal with ensuring that everything is right. Okay? Session is responsible for setting up, managing, and then tearing down sessions between the presentation layers. Again. Who's opened up two or three? You open up Skype, you open up uh, Internet Explorer, and you have a chat window open. They're all using TCP IP. They're all going out to the Internet. But when you type in chat, your information doesn't show up in Internet Explorer, does it? Our session layer makes sure it gets to the right place. Now that we get into the lower layers, which are what we're going to be most concerned about as a CCNA, the transport layer. It can be either connectionless or connection oriented. It deals with uh, flow control, data integrity, and it's ensured through the flow control. When we talk about this, we're saying, okay, I'm going to send you some information. 
it doesn't send it as one big blurb. It breaks it down into little segments. As they come in, he's going to say, yep, segment one's good, segment two good, segment three good, segment four, wait a minute, I'm missing it. Send me segment four again. I get five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten is bad. Send me ten again. I don't start at the beginning. I start where I left off. That way, as it puts our movie or our video or our music back together, it puts segment one before two, two before three, so that our music works properly. Flow control. The segment delivers, uh, delivered are acknowledged. There's a lot of overhead dealing with uh, TCP. Again, it's important if we're missing things and we don't get them again, our video is never going to work. Our conference call is going to be, oh, no, ah, oh, ain't going to work. Flow control is very important to us. Any segments not acknowledged are retransmitted. I got one, two, three. I didn't get four. Send me four again. Okay, I got four. Keep going. Segments are sequenced back into their proper order upon arrival at their destination. We want one starting before ten. Ten can't go before two. And a manageable data flow is maintained in order to avoid congestion, overloading, or data loss. Connection Orientated communication has a three-way handshake, okay? I put it in terms of a telephone call. Think about this. You just heard some great information about a horse that's going to win on the 7th <laughs> down at Suffolk. And you, I want to call Kirk up and give him that information. So I'm going to dial up Kirk's phone number on my phone, and I'm going to go, ring, ring. Kirk's going to go, hello? Number one. He answered, so at least I'm talking to somebody. I'm going to say, hey, is Kirk there? Now, I'm, he's going to say, I'm Kirk, or this is Kirk. How can I help you? Now, he's acknowledged me. I acknowledged him. We have a three-way handshake. If I call Kirk and I say, Kirk is here, and he says, no comprende, I'm not going to tell him about the horse, am I? <laughs> I'm, only t I'm calling Kirk to give him a little help. I'm not just going to give my data to anybody. I'm being very specific. I only want Kirk to have it. But if he doesn't answer the phone or they say, no, Kirk is here, I'm going to say, thank you. I'm going to break that connection. That's what TCP will do. Connection oriented. And until I really know who I'm speaking to, I'm not transmitting any data. If I don't know the web server that I'm going to is really the web server, do I want to put my username, password, and social security number on it? I think twice. So TCP, we think of as a phone call. It's connection oriented. We know who we're talking to. If we don't, we don't send. On, chap on page 19, they talk about windowing. The receiving device can control what is happening. We don't acknowledge each segment upon receipt. That would really slow us down. So windowing is used to set a number of segments that would be received before an acknowledgement is set. And this is adjustable by the receiver. In other words, think about this. Hey, Kurt, did you hear about the horse we're going to get on page? He says, wait a minute, slow down. Okay, hey, Kirk, did you hear about horse number? He said, come on, go talk a little faster now. He's going to control how much data I can. And he's not going to acknowledge every single segment that is sent. He's going to go, okay, got that. 
Okay, I got that. But he's not doing it for every word. He's doing it for sentences or little sections. Hey, I want you to turn right here, okay? Turn left here, okay? Go two blocks, okay? I don't have to go all the way back to turn right if he says, huh? I only have to go, go two miles. What was your question, Charlie? Yes, I've a three-way uh, handshake of a virtual circuit. Now, what is a virtual circuit? Virtual means it is not a real wire between point A and point B. Because it can change. As routers come up and routers go down or network topologies change, it, it creates it. Think about this. Do you know how the telephone system works? When you pick up your telephone in your house, there's a wire going up to the pole. That wire goes to a central office. Once it gets into the central office, how do you think it gets to California in, in 10 seconds? Little switches start turning on and turning off, making that connection. That's virtual, because as soon as you hang up, those switches get used to something else. Also, virtual is like temporary. And it's, it's temporary, and it's not, if you call again, you might go through a different set of switches. That's why it's virtual. Okay? Depends if we're talking layer two or yeah. layer three. And again, telephone systems don't necessarily packet switch. Oh, they do? They can mm -hmm. do circuit oh. switching. All right. We'll, we'll hit that later, too. Right, right. But that's why it's virtual, because every time you do it, it is not the same thing. Now, we can create a dedicated wire between our office and our branch office. We're going to pay big bucks to have that dedicated circuit always open for us, but we can do it. And we'll see later on in life why we might do it. So windowing just helps us control the flow. If I'm sending too fast, Kurt's going to tell me to slow down. If I'm not sending fast enough, he's going to tell me to, hey, speed it up a little. And he's going to acknowledge, but not every single packet that he gets or every single segment, he's going to acknowledge in blocks. Hey, I'll acknowledge every 50th or every 15th, depending on where I am comfortable receiving. Acknowledgement. Ensure reliability of our data integrity. Basically, it keeps track of the data that has been received and what has not. It will only request retransmissions of unreceived segments. I get one, two, three, four, and five. I don't need them again. I get seven, but some reason six got blown away from me. I'm going to get six again. Only six. Says on page 21. Yeah, just showing you. It received one, two, three. It acknowledged receipt of four, or acknowledged, and then four. Connection was lost on five. It says send me basically five again. Now, this happens in the thousands, the hundreds of thousands in seconds. Okay, The amount of traffic that this will do at this speed is uncomprehensible to our brain. I mean, we're talking nanosecond, microsecond. I mean, think, how long does it take to ping Google? Milliseconds? This happens very, very quick. Of course, that's if we have a good connection. If we have a slow dial-up at 2400 baud, different story. But hopefully we are not using old dial-ups anymore. <laughs> so network layer, called layer 3, manages device addressing, tracks location of devices on the network, and determines the best way to move data between devices that are not locally attached. Routers are specified at layer 3. So again, if we look at our network 
for a network. And it's going to be a simple network because it's easier to draw around the board. I got a router. Oh, I like your cloud. That's my cloud. <laughs> so I'm directly connected to my ISP with a public IP address they gave me with the subnet mask they gave me. I'm going to Google. My first hop through here is probably going to be their router. Once it hits their router, I have no clue at all where it's actually going until it gets to another router that gets me to the network where there's a Google machine that's going to respond. We have seen that in a trace route. Remember we did a trace route to Desktop or to Google. It took like 17 hops. That's out in this cloud. We have no control over it. If something goes down in that cloud, it's going to reroute or re create a new route. It's most of the time self-sufficient. But if it goes down, our only recourse is to call him saying, hey, I can't get someplace. Okay? His first thing is, well, it's you. It's you. And we have to prove if it's us or that. Bingo. And that's where our ping, I can there. ping up to so far, I can trace route and it drops it. You. I've done that I don't know how many times. Call up the ISP and say, hey, I can hit your side of my router, but I can't go beyond. Can that. That's your responsibility. So, the network layer deals with routers and how to get from point A to point B. And when we get into routing in chapter 9, 8, and 9, we're going to be building this. That's the whole purpose of this course. So, there are two types of packets used at the network layer. They have data packets used to transport user data through the net, internetwork based on IP4 or 6. And then there's route update packets, which are used to update neighboring routers about networks connected to other routers in our network or our internetwork. These are where we're going to start talking about routing protocols like RIP, EIGRP, and OSPF. And these are tools that we put on routers that help them talk to each other and know about other routers beyond <coughs> them. Usually our two routers, if we have two routers, they always know about each other. But A, us, doesn't know everybody else unless we put some information in and say, hey, I'm going to use EIGRP. He's going to use EIGRP. He's going to use EIGRP. Okay. I, I have a question. If it's about EIGRP, don't. It's not. Okay. No. It's just about differentiate, differentiating a routed protocol and routing protocols. We'll get to that when we get into routing, router, and routing protocols. Oh, okay. But basically, these are just, think about like this. I know Patty. Patty knows Sandy. Sandy knows Tom. Tom knows Charlie. Do I know Charlie? Not unless Patty tells me who Charlie is or how to get there. Now, Patty also knows Dave. Dave knows Steve, who knows Charlie. If for some reason Sandy isn't there, Patty can talk to Dave. Dave can talk to... Steve, Steve can get to Charlie. Dave breaks down, Sandy comes back up, I can get to Charlie through Sandy. Now, Sandy also knows Rich, Rich knows Sandy, Sandy knows, you see how this is going to work? I'm going to learn how to get from point A to point B dynamically. We can set up static routes that says, hey, if I go to Patty, I'm always using this IP address. 
And if Patty goes down, I can't get to anybody else because she's out of the loop. But if it's dynamic, Patty's up, Sandy goes down, I can go to Rich, I can go to Dave. If Sandy comes back up and it's fast to go to Sandy than it is to go to everybody else, routing protocols. How routers communicate with each other. Network addresses. Protocol specific network addresses are maintained by a router or by the router. You will have an IP. You can have IPv6. We can have IPX or SPX. You'll never see those anymore because those are netware. They were network specific and they were proprietary and that's why netware went out of business. They didn't jump on TCP IP. They sat on, they sat on IPX and SPX too long. Because of that, for the longest time, you couldn't set up your workstation to get on the internet through NetWare. The first client-server application I worked on was a utility that you'd install on your NetWare server that could give you TCP IP so your NetWare guys could get out on the internet. Again, early days of the internet, we're talking mid-90s, the first the first version of Netscape I used was one. You had to buy it. Imagine that. Paying for an internet browser. You had to you had Windows 311. You didn't have a TCP IP stack. You had to go get one or find one. The company I worked for made it. Cost five hundred bucks a seat. <laughs> there was one free one out there too. Everybody used the free one. Windows 95 came out, stack was put right into the operating system. Why do I need you anymore if I can get it free from Microsoft? Why do I have to buy Netscape? I can get it free from Microsoft. See how that works. Now you can get Netscape and Firefox and Mozilla or Chrome or Opera or Safari for free. Why? You have to pay for it. I'm going to just use it in an explorer that's built into the operating system. So that's at the, the address layer. An interface, we're going to talk interfaces, basically is an exit for packets. Most routers need two interfaces, one in, one out. Yes, we can have a router that has one. It's not going to do much, but we can have one that will do one. Okay? We might be trying out a machine doing some configurations. Most of the time they have two. They can have three, four, five. They can have ten. Depends on what we buy and what we're doing. So we're going to be talking interfaces. We're going to be talking metric. A metric is a calculation to figure out the, the distance to a remote network. Mm -hmm. There's different things we're going to be talking about. First one we look at is hop count. How many devices do I have to go through to get to Charlie? If I can go to Sandy, uh, Patty, Sandy, Tom, that's going to be three hops to get to Charlie. If I have to go to Sandy, to Rich, to Dave, to Steve, to Charlie, now I'm up to four. This way is cheaper. It's not always better, but it's cheaper in hub counts. And here's the example, and we're going to see this again. I connect to Sandy, oh, I'm sorry, I connect to Patty using my standard Ethernet, 100 mil. Sandy connects, <laughs> well, Patty connects to Sandy using a dial up modem, where she connects to Tom using a dial up modem, and he connects to Charlie using a dial up modem. But if I go to Sandy to Rich, he's using a T3. T3, T3. Even though this is more hops, it's a hell of a lot faster than going through the dialogues. Those are things we're going to be taking into consideration when we're doing network routing. 
On page 22, routers by default will not forward any broadcast or multicast packets. See that by default again. Kind of important for us. Routers use the logical address in a network layer header to determine the next hop route to forward the packet to. Routers can use access lists created by an administrator an administrator to control security on the type of packs that are allowed to enter and or exit. Routers can provide layer 2 bridging functions if needed and can simultaneously route through the same interface. Layer 3 devices, again routers, and we're going to hear this over and over and over again. Provide connections between virtual LANs, VLANs, and, router, and routers can provide quality of service for specific types of network traffic. Quality of service says these guys are getting a little extra priority. Again, video, video conferencing, telephone calls, we want that to get a little more priority so our phone calls are nice and clear and our videos are coming in without being choppy over somebody that's reading or playing farm bill. That was layer three network. Layer two, the data link, provides the physical transmission of data and handles error notification, network topology, and flow control. This means that the data link layer will ensure that messages are delivered to the proper device in the LAN using hardware addresses and will translate messages from the network layer into bits for the physical layer. The data link is actually broken down to two subcomponents. Within there we have LLC, the logical link control, and we have MAC, media access control. And they both have a specification. One is 802.2, responsible for identifying network layer protocols and then encapsulating them. We'll talk about encapsulation in a little while. On the Mac, 802.3 defines how packets are placed on the media. Switches and bridges operate at layer 2. I've already seen that. They both read each frame as it passes through the network. Layer 2 devices can then put the source hardware address into a filter table and keep track of which ports the frames are received on. We've already talked about that. He, he knows who he's getting information from, so he knows who to send information back to. This information will help the machines determine the locations of a specific sending device. And then we finally get down to the physical layer on page 26. It does two things. It sends bits, it receives bits. Not difficult. Again, one is a high voltage, zero is a low voltage. Because we can't send a one, it doesn't know what a one is. It's using electrical current. High up on, up, 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 you know, and it knows how to deal with what it's receiving. The physical layer specifies the electrical, mechanical, procedural, and functional requirements for activating, maintaining, and deactivating a physical link between end systems. And at the very bottom of this page, or in, I have on a note, DTE, Data Terminal Equipment, us. DCE, Data Communication Equipment, this is usually our ISP. There are times it can be us also if we have a larger network that has a bunch of routers. But for most of the time, and we're going to see these, this later, but it was a note here. They mentioned, they don't really tell us what it is. I just wanted you to make sure you write it down. A lot of acronyms know them. What's the second one? DCE, Data C Communication yeah, Equipment. Both of them are routers. Router can be a DT or a DC. 
And we'll see that when we set them up, especially in WANs. So that is chapter one. Wasn't that fun? Oh, come on. <laughs> okay, let's take 10. John, I'm going to stop this broadcast and start another one if you are still out there.